201 years ago this August, an event took place that was described by historian Robert Poole as a political earthquake in the northern powerhouse of the Industrial Revolution. The Peterloo Massacre at St Peter's Field in Manchester on the 16th of August 1819 occurred when cavalry charged into a crowd of 60,000 protesters who had gathered to demand the reform of parliamentary representation. Whilst history rightly celebrates the suffragette movement's success in gaining votes for women 100 years later, the Peterloo Massacre ushered in the beginning of the end for an electoral inequity that was every bit as egregious. At the end of the Napoleonic Wars, only 11% of the adult male population of the UK had the vote. Suffrage was held by the landowning class, or by people who could easily be influenced by them, in so-called rotten boroughs. Just a few voters elected members of Parliament. In the now defunct constituency of Old Sarum in Wiltshire, one voter elected two MPs. More than half of the members of Parliament in the House of Commons were elected by less than 100 voters. The urban areas of Manchester had no MPs at all. Unrest began when an economic slump followed the wars, bringing high unemployment, together with harvest failure and the hated corn laws which kept the price of bread artificially high, the situation for industrial workers became desperate. Reformers saw changes to the parliamentary system as the best solution, and in 1817 raised a petition of three quarters of a million signatures, demanding votes for all men. Not surprisingly, the petition was flatly rejected by Parliament. A further slump in 1819 led more radical reformers to advocate mass protest in an attempt to force the government to back down. The deprived North West answered the call in particular numbers, and the Manchester Patriotic Union organised a mass rally in August 1819 to be addressed by the well-known radical orator Henry Hunt. Previous meetings earlier that year had passed off without incident, but as numbers in attendance grew and the movement spread across the country, the government of the day became alarmed. Local magistrates, who in those days wielded immense power on behalf of central government, had informed the authorities that momentum was growing towards a general uprising. In return, the government made clear that should magistrates decide to use force to break up the gatherings, they would be indemnified by Parliament. Government spies had also intercepted communications between the reformers, which further convinced them that an armed uprising was in the works. In fact, the Manchester Patriotic Union had no intention of an uprising. By contrast, they intended to make sure that the demonstration was peaceful and well organised. Unfortunately, their preparations, which involved drilling groups of demonstrators in how the gathering would be organised, were misinterpreted by government informers, who reported that the reformers were preparing for a military conflict. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider subscribing. Thank you. Monday, August the 16th, 1819, saw glorious summer weather, which almost certainly swelled the crowd that descended on St. Peter's Field. The Manchester magistrates resolved to take a wait-and-see approach to events and gathered to observe the demonstration at a house that overlooked the southeastern corner of the field. As insurance against a riot, or even rebellion, they had arranged for well over a thousand regular troops and local militia to be deployed in the area. At around noon, after the crowd had gathered, several hundred special constables took to the field, forming a line break in the crowd so that the magistrates could see what was going on. The crowd believed that this line break was to facilitate the arrest of Hunt and the organisers, 
and attempted to close ranks. At 1 p.m., Hunt arrived to speak. He took to the stage, flanked by other prominent reformers and the protest organizers. Upon seeing the rapturous reception for Hunt, William Hulton, the chairman of the magistrates, immediately issued an arrest warrant for Hunt and several of the other reformers present. On being informed by the constabulary that such an arrest would require military assistance, Hulton immediately dispatched two letters by horse, summoning cavalry to the field. As the first detachment to receive a letter, the Manchester and Salford Yeomanry galloped to the field, resulting in the first casualty of the day. Two-year-old William Files was killed by a trooper whose horse knocked down his mother, throwing the child from her arms. It has been alleged that this initial cavalry detachment, led by Captain Hugh Hornby Burley, were drunk when they arrived. In any event, their procession through the line break to execute the warrant was chaotic and ill-disciplined. As the horses reared, the cavalrymen began hacking at the crowd with their sabres. Shortly after 1.40pm, the yeomanry had arrived at the speaker's stand, and following on, Deputy Constable Joseph Naden executed the arrest warrant against Hunt and the others. Instead of withdrawing speedily, the Manchester Salford Yeomanry then set about destroying the stage and banners, before attempting to pitch into the crowd and destroy any banner they could see. Watching from a distance, Hulton somehow deduced that the Yeomanry were themselves being attacked. This coincided with the arrival of the 15th Hussars, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Guy Lestrange. At 1.50pm, Hulton ordered them to disperse the gathering. Forming a line on the eastern edge of the field, they charged the crowd, sabres drawn. However, the demonstrators found it difficult to disperse since the main exit was blocked by the 88th Regiment of Foot, with bayonets fixed. With the Manchester and Salford Yeomanry out of control, carnage ensued. By the time the crowd had escaped the field ten minutes later, eleven people were dead or died later, and more than six hundred injured. Four of the dead were women, and some attendees allege that women in particular were targeted by the cavalry. Later figures have cast the death toll as high as 18, but the true figure will likely never be known. Major riots followed all around Manchester, which were not quelled until the following day. Public reaction was a mixture of horror and outrage. This was one of the first major events at which national journalists were present and the news quickly reached major cities, inflaming national opinion. On hearing of the massacre, Percy Bliss Shelley, the Romantic poet, penned The Mask of Anarchy, which is still quoted by radicals today. But Shelley's poem, like the journalism accompanying it, was immediately suppressed in a nationwide crackdown by the reactionary parliament. Newspapers and journalists were regularly raided on the merest suspicion that they might be writing an article on the massacre or on reform. Hunt eventually received a 30-month prison sentence for sedition. Other members of the reform movement were also jailed. By 1820, following the passing of the so-called Six Acts, suppressing all organised opposition, every significant reformer was imprisoned. Civil liberties were even more restricted than before the massacre. All unjust tyrannies eventually crumble. But it took until 1832 before the first steps towards true representation came, in the form of the Great Reform Act. Though still unsatisfactory, the genie was out of the bottle. Slow, incremental steps throughout the rest of the 19th century consigned Regency England to the history books, and representative democracy would replace it totally by the end of World War I. The present day is currently defined by protests on many issues, 
in many countries. Civil liberties and representative democracy seem in the balance, just as they were in 1819. Thankfully, none of these protests have suffered a similar outrage to the Peterloo Massacre. At least, not yet. Whilst infamy will always remember William Joyce as the English personification of the Nazis, he was neither the original Lord Haw Haw, nor the only English or American broadcaster to serve the propaganda arm of Hitler's Third Reich. The prospect of internment drove many British and English-speaking Nazi sympathisers to Germany, in the build-up to the Second World War. Others went there out of fanaticism for Hitler. Some were merely adventurers, caught up in the naive excitement surrounding a rapidly rising power, unaware of the horrific crimes that Hitler had planned. Yet the First Lord Haw Haw was, almost certainly, German. Wolf Mittler was a professional journalist working in German radio who was roped into the early Nazi propaganda broadcasts to England. A fluent English speaker, courtesy of his Irish-born mother, his Bertie Worcester-style caricature of an Englishman led radio critic Jonah Barrington to refer to that style as Haw Haw. It's not known for certain that it was to him Barrington was referring when the term was coined, but as the preeminent voice for the Germany calling program, it was likely Mittler that Barrington was hearing, at least in the early days. Unlike the vast majority of the others, Mittler was not a Nazi, nor even particularly political. His lack of enthusiasm led to his replacement on Germany calling. In 1943, the Nazis became suspicious of his true sympathies. After initially fleeing to Italy, the Gestapo caught up with and arrested him. Managing to escape to Switzerland, he returned to Germany following the war, enjoying an extensive career in German radio and television. This included covering momentous events, providing live translations of John F. Kennedy's speech on the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Apollo 11 moon landing. He lived until 2002, without any stain on his character from the Nazi era. Mittler's replacement on Germany calling was Norman Bailey Stewart, a former British Army officer who had left the military in disgrace after being convicted of spying for a foreign power. He had fallen for a German woman in 1931. Attempting to gain German citizenship, he recklessly offered to spy for them. After being caught and sentenced to five years, he had the distinction of being the last prisoner to be held in the Tower of London. Following his release, the disgraced Bailey Stewart drifted to Austria, where he was originally expelled under suspicion of being a Nazi agent. Hitler's takeover of the country allowed him a route back, and when he critiqued the Germany calling broadcasts at a party of Nazi sympathisers in Vienna, he was invited to audition for the role himself, which he did successfully. A week before Britain declared war on Germany, he made his first broadcast. Yet Bailey Stewart would be spared the hangman after the war. His broadcasting career was a very short one, followed by non-treasonous translator roles at the German Foreign Ministry that would see him serve just five years after the war. He was becoming disillusioned with Nazism. In addition, he was being outshone by his then obscure understudy on Germany Calling, a broadcasting superstar in the making, named William Joyce. Bailey Stewart settled in Dublin and lived a quiet family life until his death from a heart attack in 1966. Dorothy Eckersley, 
a confirmed Nazi sympathizer who moved to Germany in 1939, was a close friend of Joyce and was directly responsible for bringing the penniless and unemployed drifter into broadcasting after a chance meeting in Berlin. Eckersley was also a broadcaster, providing links and announcements in the English language service. She also brought her son, James Clark, into the business of broadcasting Nazi propaganda. After 1941, following infighting among the broadcasting community, both mother and son were sidelined, but the Germans still regarded James as an asset. In 1944, they attempted to bring James back, but mother and son no longer wanted to participate, and they ended up in an internment camp. After the war, both were charged with treason, but were no longer considered enthusiastic Nazis, especially James, who was thought to be entirely under the influence of his mother. He received a suspended sentence, while his mother only received 12 months. Raymond Davies Hughes was a Welsh RAF airman who made broadcasts after being taken prisoner when forced to bail out of an RAF bomber over Germany in 1943. A complete opportunist, he fell somewhat unwittingly into the clutches of the Nazis. Having been tricked into thinking he was collecting POW information for the Red Cross in the camps, information that was later used in interrogation, he found himself compromised, but was rewarded with special privileges. Upon agreeing to make broadcasts in Welsh to Welsh troops fighting in the Italian campaign, he was moved to Berlin. There, Hughes enjoyed a high degree of freedom, with his own flat and a salary. Sometime in 1944, though, he displeased the Nazis in some way or other, was stripped of his privileges and sent back to a POW camp. Charged with multiple counts of aiding the enemy after the war, he was found partially guilty and sentenced to five years hard labour, reduced to two on appeal. Since there was no suggestion that he was ever a Nazi and was purely in it for his own ends, he returned to society and lived normally until his death in 1999. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider subscribing. Thank you. A number of Americans also made broadcasts for the Nazis via shortwave radio to the US, both before and after American entry into the war. Frederick Kaltenbach was born in Iowa, the son of a German emigre father. Kaltenbach and his brother happened to be on a cycling tour of Germany when World War I broke out. But despite being detained for a few months on suspicion of spying, his enthusiasm for all things German was undimmed. After several years teaching back home in Iowa, he gained a scholarship to the University of Berlin in 1933, where he became an ardent follower of the Nazis. This didn't go down well when he returned home, and he left for Germany again in 1936. Taking a translator's job for German radio, he soon graduated to broadcasting propaganda. Letters to Iowa, a program in the form of fictional letters home, beginning with the words, Greetings to my old friend Harry in Iowa, disseminated anti-British, pro-isolation propaganda, discouraging American involvement in European matters. Once America entered the war, his broadcasts became actionable. Knowing this, and feeling disillusioned with Nazism, Kaltenbach's broadcasts diminished greatly. With a treason charge hanging over his head and declining health, Near the end of the war, he sought to ingratiate himself with anti-Nazi elements, but to no avail. The Soviets arrested him in Berlin, refusing to hand him over to the Americans, and Kaltenbach died in a prisoner of war camp shortly afterwards. 
Robert Best was a foreign correspondent covering Europe for US media outlets in the interwar period. Based in Vienna, he gradually came to sympathize with Hitler after their occupation of Austria. Having been fired by US publications, he offered his services to the Nazis, but was initially rebuffed. When the US declared war, he was arrested for the purposes of deportation, but this time was able to convince the Nazis to put him behind a microphone, his first broadcast coming on the 10th of April 1942. He broadcast as Mr. Guess Who, with the usual diatribes against Roosevelt, Jews, Churchill and Bolshevism, yet with an unbridled vehemence that made him something of a standout. As defeat loomed for Nazi Germany, he fled Vienna, but left behind documents which identified him as Mr. Guess Who. Captured by the British in January 1946 and handed over to US forces, he was convicted of 12 counts of treason and sentenced to life. He died in prison of a brain hemorrhage on the 16th of December 1952. Douglas Chandler was a Chicago-born former U.S. Navy officer who became a journalist. Ruined in the Wall Street crash of 1929, he moved first to France, then Germany, becoming a reporter for National Geographic. His articles for them led to later criticism that the magazine had been far too favourable to Nazi Germany. Chandler's propaganda broadcasts for German state radio began in April 1941 under the pseudonym Paul Revere. The programme began with clattering hooves and Yankee Doodle Dandy, followed by exhortations to the US to stay out of the war and confront the threats of Bolshevism. Dubbed America's Lord Haw Haw for his cultivated voice, he was one of the top earners on German state radio. Following the war, he was arrested then released by US forces, before finally being tried for treason in 1946. His plea of insanity failed, and his conviction brought with it a sentence of life imprisonment. He served only 16 years though, being released by President Kennedy on condition that he leave the United States. He was last known to be living quietly in the Canary Islands in the 1970s and is presumed to have died there. The story of the English language Nazi propaganda effort on radio is a fascinating one, filled with equally fascinating characters. But as with so many things, in a complex web, with a cast of dozens, or even hundreds. Infamy or stardom falls only on the few, or the one. Eighty years on, history seems to have forgotten all the others. Only remembering the man who was its Johnny-come-lately, it's not even original Lord Haw Haw, but it's radio superstar. William Joyce. Germany calling, Germany calling, Germany calling. In 1990s London, staff and customers of Barclays Bank and Sainsbury's supermarket were terrorized by a cunning and bizarre bombing and extortion campaign that left police and psychologists baffled. Known as the Mardi Gras Bomber, after the codename the offender used in communicating his blackmail demands, it would take four years to unmask the man who was described by police as a callous, calculating individual who was wholly indifferent to the possibility that his devices might cause death. The first bombs had been sent to six branches of Barclays Bank in North and West London on the 6th of December 1994. The unusual design including shotgun cartridges and bullets, triggered by springs, seemed to rule out a highly skilled bomb maker. Nevertheless, they were effective. Two of them exploded, 
one injuring an employee of Barclays. The homespun devices left police with a potentially vast number of people in the frame. As one detective admitted at the outset of the operation, if it's a disgruntled bank customer, that gives us about 10 million possible suspects. Shortly after the initial bombs were sent, the extortionist contacted Barclays with his demands. Credit cards were to be made available to him, so that he could receive money anonymously. The bank refused, passing the letter on to the police, who tried to negotiate clandestinely through coded messages to Mardine Graham in the Daily Telegraph personal ads columns. Having been rebuffed by Barclays, the bomber directed his campaign at random members of the public, presumably to show he meant business. Devices were sent or delivered to private addresses, businesses and telephone boxes in London and the home counties. Then suddenly, the campaign ended, only to restart dramatically a year later in January 1996, when a device exploded in a West London street. The bomber contacted the Daily Mail, stating in a letter, Mardi Gras is the code name of a small group of Barclays Bank victims who are in the process of reversing the tide of fortune in their favour after a year of inactivity. Our earlier devices were designed as frighteners to demonstrate political will, ability to strike, and access to a constant supply of explosive material. We are amazed that a bank or company appears to be able not to care who gets injured and get the police to keep quiet about it. Threats of future action were promised a week later, with another statement. The targets will be Barclays customers going to or from a bank, cash point, and or followed home for residential strikes. After a Barclays executive seemed to suggest in a television appearance that the company would not accede to blackmail, a letter was received by Sainsbury's threatening to bomb their supermarkets if they didn't pay a similar demand. The company ignored it, and yet again, the campaign went on an extended hiatus. No more was heard from the bomber for 19 months. The campaign resumed in November 1997. Devices were planted hidden in video boxes for the Steve Martin film Grand Canyon with stickers on them offering a £5 reward if they were returned to Sainsbury supermarket branches. Police couldn't understand how the bomber was not on closed-circuit television near the scenes of the bomb plantings. They theorised that the bomber was either disguising himself as a woman, or was even a police officer, with intimate knowledge of surveillance in the area. Criminal profilers suggested that the man would be an obsessive grudge-bearer, whose grudge would be petty, such as being refused a credit card by Barclays, or short-changed in Sainsbury's. He would be quiet, embittered, and middle-aged. The police were flailing, though, even sending armed officers to take down a man seen behaving strangely behind a Sainsbury's only to find out that he was a rat catcher. In the end, the bomber caught himself. In desperation, the police authorised £20,000 to be put into an account. A thousand-strong team of officers was watching cash points around the capital, with an alarm system that would be activated when the associated PIN number was entered. On Tuesday the 28th of April, 1998, the alarm went off and the police pounced. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider subscribing and please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. The man who had fallen into the trap was 60-year-old Edgar Pierce. He had indeed had a past dispute with Barclays Bank. At the time of his arrest, he was unemployed and divorced, living in the affluent area of Chiswick in West London. 
Pierce had had an earlier career in the advertising industry, but his life spiralled downhill following health problems, alcoholism and divorce. Alone in his home, he was inspired by a television programme about Rodney Wichelow, a former police detective who had extorted £30,000 from supermarkets by tampering with baby food. Wichelow had become sloppy and been caught. Pierce believed he could pull off a similar scheme and get away with it. Although he overestimated his intelligence, he was without doubt a cunning criminal. He wore specific clothes for planting bombs, so that he couldn't be identified by his acquaintances. He wore wigs, changed his hair, and covered his tracks expertly on the items he used to contain his devices. Pierce never divulged his motive. Although they were in part financial, it seems clear there were psychological factors at play. At trial, his lawyers claimed he suffered from Binswanger's disease, a rare form of dementia that can change the way people think. But following further medical reports, the judges at the Old Bailey rejected this. Erratic and unpredictable, Pierce fired one lawyer and hired another, agreed to plead guilty, then changed his mind. On the 14th of April, 1999, he was convicted of 20 charges, including causing an explosion, possessing firearms and wounding. He was sentenced to 224 years. The Stanford Prison Experiment was a study in social psychology that investigated the psychological effect of power. It took place at Stanford University, California on the 14th to the 20th of August, 1971. A group of researchers, led by Professor Philip Zimbardo, conducted the experiment on volunteer college students assigning them to roles as either guards or prisoners, depending on the toss of a coin. Zimbardo himself presided as the superintendent of the supposed prison. Originally scheduled for two weeks, the resulting study was a controversial and disturbing fiasco that revealed the dark side of the human psyche. The study was funded by the U.S. Office of Naval Research, after problems between guards and prisoners in U.S. Navy prisons. Investigating the power of roles, rules, symbols and group identity, it quickly degenerated into a sadistic and authoritarian power game, reinforcing the uncomfortable truth that ordinary people can easily be led into reprehensible behaviour, and that the recipients of that behaviour will for the most part, passively accept it. The 24 male participants were selected by test. Only those who were considered mentally stable and those without a criminal background were considered. Conducted in a 35-foot section of a basement at a university psychology building, the 12 prisoners were held in 6 by 9 feet cells 24 hours a day whilst the twelve guards lived in a different area, with rest and relaxation. Nine prisoners and nine guards were active, with a further three prisoners and guards as potential substitutes. A research assistant took on the role of a warden, alongside Zimbardo's superintendent. In an orientation for the guards, Zimbardo asserted that while the guards could not be violent, or withhold food and drink, they could instill a degree of fear and powerlessness aimed at stripping the prisoners of all individuality. The guards wore uniforms, carried batons, and wore sunglasses to prevent eye contact, while the prisoners wore rough, ill-fitting smocks, as well as an ankle chain. Guards only referred to prisoners by a number, the Palo Alto Police Department assisted the study 
by conducting simulated arrests and processing of the prisoners, including mugshots and fingerprinting. From the police station, they were transported to the mock prison, even being strip-searched as they arrived. The small mock prison cells held three prisoners each. Down a small corridor was the prison yard, a closet for solitary confinement, and a bigger room across from the prisoners for the guards and warden. The prisoners were confined to the cells and yard 24-7 until the end of the study. The guards worked in teams of three for eight-hour shifts and were not required to stay on site after their shifts ended. Those designated as guards had greatly differing responses to the situation. Those who were aggressive felt that they were doing the bidding of the study's organisers. Others felt sorry for the prisoners. Zimbardo's assistant, or warden, David Jaffe, encouraged the more lenient characters to adopt a get-tough attitude. The study began uneventfully. On day two, prisoners in cell one blockaded their cell door with their beds, refusing to come out or follow guards' instructions. Guards from other shifts volunteered to come off duty and assist in subduing the revolt, which they did by attacking the prisoners with fire extinguishers. To counter the fact that each guard shift was outnumbered, one of the guards suggested they keep prisoners in line with psychological warfare. Prisoners who behaved were to be given special meals and better all-round treatment than those who resisted. 35 hours in, prisoner 8612 flew into a rage, screaming and cursing and demanding to be released. He was treated indifferently before eventually being released from the experiment. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider subscribing, and please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Stepping up their psychological warfare, guards forced the prisoners to repeat their prisoner numbers, aimed at assaulting their identity. Mistakes were punished by harassment or protracted physical exercise. Sanitary conditions declined rapidly. Prisoners who displeased the guards were not allowed to urinate or defecate anywhere except in a bucket placed in their cells, which would not be emptied. Mattresses were also removed as punishment, leaving prisoners to sleep on concrete. Further punishments included forced nudity. Guard cruelty escalated with every new punishment. The study concluded that one-third of the guards had sadistic tendencies, while others became caught up and corrupted by the situation. Zimbardo himself became sucked into the unreality. On day four, there was a rumour amongst the guards that the released prisoner was planning to come back team-handed and forcibly release the others. The prison was disassembled and moved onto a different floor of the building. Zimbardo waited in the basement for the imagined mob to show up to convince them that the experiment had been ended. When they never came, the prison was returned to its original location. Prisoners seemed to have similarly taken on their role. Many spoke of parole or getting out, appearing to forget that they could leave at any time. The turning point came when the replacement for the prisoner who had departed was brought into the study. Prisoner 416, with a fresh pair of eyes, immediately complained about treatment and conditions. The guards were furious, and when 416 refused to eat his sausages, announcing that he was on hunger strike, he was placed in the solitary confinement cupboard. The other prisoners were forced to bang on the door and shout to further intimidate him. The guards then tried to introduce collective punishment for any misbehaviour. As the experiment descended into chaos, Zimbardo's girlfriend, who arrived to conduct research interviews, 
told Zimbardo that she found the experiment objectionable and immoral. After six days, on the 20th of August 1970, Zimbardo called the whole thing off. In his conclusions, Zimbardo thought that the prison system, rather than personality traits, had caused participants to act as they did. He also cited cognitive dissonance, the theory that individuals under stress will do things they otherwise would find objectionable. The ethics and conclusion of the study were widely attacked. It was alleged that much of the behaviour was as a result of the direct intervention and encouragement of Zimbardo and others, as well as the so-called Hawthorne effect. In layman's terms, that the participants were playing to the gallery. In an unintended way, the study seemed to validate some theories outside its original remit, whilst not appearing to validate Zimbardo's own conclusions. Some good did come from the study. It was used to change the way youth offenders were treated in the US prison system. Overall, though, it was lightly regarded as science, with Zimbardo eventually admitting in 2018 that it was more demonstration than scientific experiment. Perhaps its greatest value is to the layman rather than the scientist. In 2020, of all years, it is a timely reminder of how hysteria and the degradation of others can drive some of us to indefensible mental or physical cruelty towards our fellow human beings. (laughs) 